Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ross Lajeunesse, and I am head of international relations for Google. I have a fairly easy job this morning, and that is to welcome all of you to Google's DC office for uh, what I know is going to be a very important and impactful conversation, both for those of you in the room and those of you on the live stream. But before I say anything else, I want to thank our partner uh, in this event. Freedom House is one of the leading organizations fighting for democracy, for human rights, and for human dignity across the globe. I want to thank Mike Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House, who's joined us this morning. The Google Freedom House relationship has been strong for many years because we both recognize that the free exchange of ideas and access to information are not just human rights, but the foundation of just and peaceful societies. So in that sense, Google and Freedom House share a common goal and a shared purpose. The word hero is used so often today that I honestly feel like it's lost some of its meaning. We use the word hero to describe athletes and authors and actors. And at least here in the US, I think we too often conflate uh, the word hero with celebrity, notoriety, whatever. But today, we're going to hear from two individuals, Yelena Melashena and Igor Kachetkov, who truly have earned that title. Yelena is an award-winning journalist, investigative journalist. She writes about terrorism, drug trafficking, and corruption, and she was the first to expose to the outside world the brutal torture and killing of gay men in Chechnya. Igor is the founder and chair of the Russian LGBT network, where he fights for LGBT equality and dignity in his home country under truly the most difficult circumstances. His work has included helping dozens and dozens of gay Chechnyan men escape persecution, torture camps, and murder. For their work, Igor and Yelena received Freedom House's highest honor, the Freedom Award, just this past Wednesday, when they were celebrated by former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden and U.S. Senator Bob Corker, among hundreds of others. But also for their work, Yelena and Igor have received death threats, they've been arrested, They've been subject to intense harassment, threats, and intimidation. Yet, they persist. They have put truth, justice, and human dignity ahead of their own well-being, ahead of their own security, ahead of their own lives. Igor and Yelena are true heroes. And I'm confident that I speak for everyone here today and everyone on the live stream in saying that we owe you our support, our gratitude, and our most profound respect. Google and Freedom House are deeply honored to have you with us today, so thank you. We're also very honored and, quite frankly, very lucky to have Jeremy Peters lead this discussion today. Jeremy is one of the stars of the political reporting team at the New York Times. He covers the US conservative movement and President Trump and is also a contributor on MSNBC. He also has a book coming out next year that I personally can't wait to read. It's about how President Trump took over the Republican Party and what will happen to the GOP in the long term as a result. Thank you, all of you, for taking time to be with us today. And Jeremy, now I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, and thank you to Google and Freedom House for hosting this and for think, entrusting me with this, uh, this responsibility. Um, I uh, just want to say what an admirer I am of, of your work, Elena and, and Igor as well. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to start with Elena because I think as, as journalists, the hardest stories to tell are the ones that powerful people and institutions don't want us to tell. And I can 
only imagine what a di difficult, uh, often painful undertaking it must have been to report on what you discovered in Chechnya with the systematic state-sponsored suppression, uh, repression of gay men and, and, and what happened there. So I was hoping you could walk us through how you first came on to the story and how it grew from when you first learned what was really going on. First of all, I would like to thank everybody here, Freedom House and Google, for the opportunity to speak here. This is a big honor for us. What, when it comes to your question, to begin with, I would like to say that we work in Chechnya. My newspaper has been working there for 20 years. We have covered all the wars in the region. Our correspondents, Anna Politkovska and Natalia Estimirova, were killed for, what the, for their work in the region. And I have inherited, in a way, their job, their work. And I've been working there for 11 years. That is why I have a lot of um, sources among regular people, among law enforcement, and our constant work in that region that we have never left behind, never quit, never betrayed the people that we've been covering. We never left that region. This is the only Russian medium that has been continuing covering the violations of human rights in Chechnya. When we have received information, the initial information about the uh, murdered gay person, in order to clarify and verify that this is not the only sole uh, victim and there is a campaign directed at detaining men in Chechnya simply on uh, suspicion that they're gay. These people were detained and brutally um, tortured with electricity. They have been beaten in a very special way. They have been beaten in the back, legs, uh, buttocks, caned. They were not fed. They were not allowed to pray or use the bathroom only because they were gay. This was like um, the only thing they held against them. Why so much brutality towards these people? The issue is, in Chechnya for many years, there is a, a violation of human rights. They've been allowed, many people in Chechnya have been detained, tortured, put in secret prisons, the prisons where people have been detained illegally from a few weeks to up to a few years. And very often when these violations have been taking place, we had had the uh, allies, the relatives of these people, who could verify that uh, their loved ones were detained. But when it comes to gays, the uh, relatives took the side of the uh, government, not on their own volition. But we have to take into account that Chechen, so the Chechen society is very conservative and homophobic and xenophobic. And for them to have a close relative who is suspected of being gay is much worse than to have uh, a relative who's been detained and tortured on accusations of terrorism. In this particular case, we could not rely on the relatives. None of them did become our ally. Not a single one of them confirmed that their loved ones was indeed detained on this suspicion. And we could verify this information only because we had a large number of sources, including law enforcement, not only in Chechnya, but also in Moscow. This was a very difficult task when we cross. I don't remember in any single of my investigations to have achieved so much independent sources confirm the same thing. We have done quite a lot from the moment that we have found out that this first victim has died from brutal torture in a secret prison in Chechnya, that there is a real campaign and people are being arrested en masse. 
and there are murders of people prior to the publication. It had happened three, we had three weeks, and for these three weeks, people have been continuously detained. It was very difficult for us to decide to publish, go ahead with the, publish, the publication, because the victims themselves that we could reach, their relatives, the relatives of the dead people and the entire Chechen society, as the situation has showed later, did not admit that the people were detained because simply because they were gay. We could not name a single victim. We understood the weakness of our coverage when we discussed it with our management, whether we should or shouldn't publish. We say there is a campaign, but we cannot name a single victim. This, we thought this was wrong in terms of all the journalistic rules that we abide by. But on the other hand, we understand that the detain, detaining continues every day. And our publication may stop this. We decided to go ahead and publish the article. And we're very happy that we've done so. Because a few days prior to the publication, together with the Russian LGBT network, we launched a hotline for the victims. We started publishing information on all the social media up until now. I have the announcement uh, on my Facebook page that has been made a few days before the first article was published. Not a single person called this hotline before the publication. As soon as we had published, as soon as it was spread, and people understood that this is a really big story, and it created a lot of uh, noise, feedback, people started calling the hotline. and. In the first week, we received 30 phone calls from 30 people who asked us to help them, to save them. Uh, Igor, your work is, is very similar in that you also put yourself in harm's way. You've chosen an occupation that puts you in the government's crosshairs with a target on your back. And I, I was hoping you could walk us through how you chose this calling, given the difficulty that you knew you were certain to face, and what it's like every day carrying out the work that you do under those threats. Yes. Our organization of the Russian LGBT network has been around for more than 10 years, and our main goal is to monitor the situation, to monitor the violations of human rights related to the gender identity and sexual orientation, and of course, to help those who have been on the receiving end, as well as the victims of the hate crimes. I cannot say de definitively that I or my colleagues had had any choice whether to do this or not. Most, most likely, the most important reason why my colleagues and I and my friends do this is because nobody else is doing it. It's impossible to look, to just watch, stand by and watch as the Russian authorities openly on the legislative level call gays, hom uh, gays transgender persons, lesbians, socially inadequate or socially uh, lacking social uh, status. It is impossible to stand by and watch as the head of the subjects of the Russian Federation says, makes a statement that we should cleanse the blood of the Chechen people from gays. We, we civilized people, have not heard these kinds of words since the Nazi Germany times. And that is why we can't choose whether to do this or not. All right. Thank you. Um, Elena, I think when people think about how reporters do their jobs, they don't often think about the great risk that our sources are taking when they talk to us. Now, if my sources were to be exposed 
they would probably get in trouble. Um, if anyone found my phone and saw my list of contacts, it would probably be embarrassing for some of my sources to have their name in my phone and, and, and to be exposed to their bosses as, as having talked to a reporter from the New York Times. But y you face a, a much different and, and more dangerous situation in interacting with the people you have to speak to to do your work. Their lives are at risk if they talk to you. So I wonder if you could tell us how you safeguard their identities, their anonymity, so when they do speak to you, they won't be putting themselves at risk. You want me to tell you about the technology that I cannot divulge. <laughs> I can say one thing. During my time working, I have received uh, quite a few uh, uh, prizes, and quite a few people have met me and told me how they are flattered to have known me. But this is not what I'm proud of, most of all in the world. What I am proud of, if there is anything, and you are right, in Chechnya, any human being who is meeting with me, who is friends with me, who is supporting me, who is uh, putting me in their trunk, not in the car, but in the trunk, so I could pass through to a location that you cannot go otherwise, this person is under grave threat. And if there is something I am uh, proud of, I'm proud of the fact that in 11 years, not a single source of mine was discovered or Have you been followed or by bus. the authorities? Yes. And the situation is, a year ago, when we had first published the articles on the uh, a gay person's persecution in Chechnya. People have gotten together, 20 people. They were not, they didn't do it on their own volition. They were brought to the, to the main uh, mosque in Chechnya and they were the religious authorities. They basically declared jihad against me and everybody who worked with us, even the cleaning ladies at Novaya Gazeta. The, the feeling was I could not go back to Chechnya and work there, but after this trip, I'm flying to Grozny next week. And in truth, this is a very important point for me to fight to claw back the right to work in Russian Federation, in the region of Russian Federation, although I know it's very dangerous. But right now in Grozny, I am meeting with my acquaintances in various organizations or in the street. They just walk by me. These are my sources. I cannot say hello to them. I cannot even smile at them. And this is a very strange situation. The, to tell more about the sources, how I protect them, I can't. Igor is aware of the situation and he agreed and he did everything understanding the specifics of life in Chechnya although he has never worked there he understands how important it is to protect our victims who have been and are the sources of information thanks to this understanding which is very rare in reality the uh, human rights defenders in Russia Russian LGBT network, we have managed to do the impossible. Yes, we couldn't stop this campaign. It is being continued up until now, one way or the other, but we managed to limit the scope, minimize the scope, and the LGBT network managed to save quite a lot of people. In 20 years of my work in journalism, I have not seen a situation that I could help so many people at the same time, and I couldn't have done this without them, never. So other than hiding in the trunk of someone's car, what have you had to do to protect yourself? We had to have done a very 
difficult work with telephones or um, uh, communication devices. It was so difficult at times that I was screaming and yelling, um, cussing Apple, Google, and smartphones because it's very difficult. And when there was no communication, these devices are wonderful, but at the same time they pose a great risk for people, first of all, people in Chechnya, because the Chechen police officers and our law enforcement officers in Russia, they're getting all the information from smartphones, from our networks, social networks. We are the first ones in Russia who had to understand this risk and assess the risk and the difficulty associated with it. Still, when I go to Chechnya, my phone is completely blank has not a single contact, because most of them I have to remember, I memorize. But there's one contact of a very high level person in the President Putin's administration with all his um, um, regalia all there. And I have a permission from that person. If it happens so that I'm detained, I'll be able to call him. The first call will be going to him and this phone call and this recording of in the contact book is one of the ways to save myself in a particular situation because the worst can happen. In reality, the only source of protection, both myself and for Igor, is you. The international uh, attention towards the crimes that are not the internal affairs of Chechnya or Russia. This is our common crime that we have to deal with, and it's very contagious. Other regimes are repeating this, and they can repeat this in their own countries. This is all of our uh, work. Igor, we most often hear about the most horrific examples of discrimination and repression of LGBT people, the, the kinds of stories that Elena has told, the, the detentions, the beatings, the torture, the killings even. But on a more basic level, I was hoping you could describe the difficulties that people face in everyday life that aren't as headline grabbing as that. First of all, we have to say that the people, the LGBT persons in Russia, just continue living their lives. They do their, they fall in love, they do their um, home cleaning, they create families, they adopt children, even in Russia it's possible. But the most important problem is that they cannot openly state that they are doing the most normal things that are respected or allowed for other people to create their own family, a loving family, to live with the loved one together, to become a parent, to become parents. Everything is allowed in Russia uh, as well as from uh, on behalf of the Russian authorities. But if that is done by gays, lesbians, bisexual persons, this is declared the worst threat. I will give you just one example. Two men, Russians, have uh, um, uh, married in Denmark where that was legal and having returned to Russia they wanted in, a, in accordance with the Russian legislation to, uh, uh, to get a stamp in their passport proving that they have married each other in accordance with the laws of a foreign country. This is a formality, a bureaucratic procedure that is um, um, 
that could be accessed by any person. When they have come to the government office, they did get their documents stamped indeed. But when the media have found out, when it was uh, basically published, publicized, dozens of police officers came to their house of these two men. They blocked the exit from their apartment. They didn't allow them to leave. They were visited by a very high-ranking police official in Moscow who negotiated with them as if they were terrorists. They were told, we will not let you leave the house until you surrender your passports. We face these situations, maybe less dramatic ones, but very similar ones, basically every day, every week, when the most common, basically, manifestation of human life or basic, um, let's say, basic action, if it is, if it comes from an LGBT person, it creates a mystical fear among the Russian authorities on behalf of the Russian authorities. And this is one of the reasons why these horrific crimes can happen, the ones that we see in Chechnya. Because Kadyrov and people in his surrounding were absolutely sure that they will, there will be impunity for the persecution of gays. The Russian representatives of the Russian Federation, they say that LGBT persons in Russia have absolutely, face absolutely no problems. In practice, it means that the Russian police, the Russian investigative uh, authorities refuse to investigate crimes against LGBT persons uh, based on uh, crimes of homophobic, based on homophobic or transphobic uh, sentiments. The uh, investigative work in Chechnya has resulted in the fact that the authorities officially proclaim that nothing happened in Chechnya and there are no gays in Chechnya. In reality, this is a common practice. We have always face a situation when the police refuse to investigate singular attacks against LGBT persons and activists, including serious attacks, serious consequences. They either ignore the information altogether or claim that the uh, uh, attack happened based on something trivial. That was one of the most striking things that I read about the Chechnya situation is that the leader of the country basically said, no, there are no gay people in Chechnya. They don't exist, which is something reminiscent of what the president of Iran said back when he was confronted about his regime's abuse of LGBT people. But when you hear a statement like that, at least from Western ears, it's, it, sounds, it sounds silly. And, and, I, and I wonder, do people actually believe that when they hear it coming from their leaders' mouths, or is it is it just something that another absurd statement made by somebody that people don't really believe anyway? You know, during this year, I have spoken with high-ranking officials of the federal government of Russia, with law enforcement and uh, people in Chechnya, with investigative units, with the apparatus of our ombudsman, Tatiana Moskatrova, with the Council on Human Rights of the Russian Federation, and with a large number of people who were very interested in this subject. I don't know a single Russian official or a law enforcement person who would not believe me they all understand that the situation is as I describe it, or even maybe much worse. But there is this. Uh, what we hear is there are no gays in Chechnya or no gays in Russia in general, not only in Chechnya, because there are no crimes against them. Therefore, we cannot have, have mass violations of human rights in Chechnya. And the Chechen police officers, 
were not brought to um, brought to justice for violation of their uh, work ethic. This is basically an impetus to say that everything is great in our country, everything is wonderful, even by refusing or denying the uh, persecution of gays in Chechnya. When Ramzan Kadyrov said that, this could be somehow explained by the conservative, xenophobic, homophobic Chechen society does not allow these people or does not recognize the right for these people to leave because to live because they from the standpoint of their views, very archaic views, it's basically something dishonorable. But when the Ministry of Justice of Russia says that somebody with a very good legal education, Konabalov, the last statement that was made very recently that our publications were not proved to be true. There are no um, traces of crimes found by the investigative units. They did not find Chechen gays in Chechnya. This is, this is a person with a very good legal education and a very good person in reality. But when he is forced to say uh, to the world, please help us find gays in Chechnya, which means there is a, an order that people have to abide by. They're not fools. They're not cynical. They do not believe what they're saying, but they have to say what they're saying. I would like to add, when you hear from the head of the Chechen government or Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation or the Minister of the President of Iran saying we don't have gays, these words have to be understood not in the way they're said, not, not in the way you do. These words have a subtext. This means we do not have these people, but if you do find them, they're not human beings and they should not be treated as such, as human beings. If there's a crime against them, that means these crimes should not be investigated. If the relatives take justice in their hands when it comes to their sons or brothers or lesbians, because women also suffer from this, then they shouldn't be punished. They shouldn't, it shouldn't be considered a crime. That is what these words mean. We don't have gays. That's the sole meaning. And when we hear these words, we must remember this is not funny at all. This, in reality, is the call to committing crime, crimes. Right, they're, they're denying these people's humanity. Uh, well, I have one last question before we open this up to the audience for their questions, and maybe we can end on something slightly more upbeat. <laughs> but what signs of progress uh, ha have either of you seen in this area? It, it, it seems that just by the, the very work that you do, this is getting more exposure. People are aware of the problems, and, and, and maybe that has caused the state to behave in a less oppressive way. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you, uh, uh, specifically Igor, on what has improved in Russia, and then Elena in, in Chechnya, what the situation is like since your work exposed the torture. When we, or you, speak of Russia, the first thing that you think of is the Russian state and its actions, its policies. But Russia is not only the state, it's not only Putin, it's not only Kadyrov and people in their surrounding. There is a Russian society as well. It's very big and it's very complicated. It has var various groups. It comprises of various interests and values. And we pay attention to the changes that happen in the society. When 10 years ago we had started our work 
and started talking to human rights defenders, opposition politicians. We, uh, people didn't want to hear us at all. And we were accused of being the agents of the uh, uh, state's uh, secret services who want to discredit opposition politicians in the country. But 10 years have elapsed. And during the last presidential elections, that, in opinion of the many, were not real elections, but there was a procedure that was followed. Two opposition candidates at the same time have included in their manifesto the demand for civil partnerships for uh, same-sex couples. Ksenia Sabchak, one of the candidates, she spoke a lot about the uh, human rights violations against LGBT persons and why that is not supposed that is not to be tolerated. Not a single liberal opposition politician can say anything openly homophobic. Liberal politician I'm speaking of. But probably the most serious achievement is the LGBT movement in Russia. We do have our own organization, not only in Moscow and Petersburg, but in many regions of Russia, who are helping with tangible things to people who educate the society. And thanks to the work of the LGBT activists, the situation is changing. And if we're, 10 years ago, if we talked about the uh, rights of the LGBT persons, the society preferred to keep mum to not notice. Nowadays, this is one of the mainstream issues for public discussion. You may watch television or read the newspapers in Russia, and at least once a week you will have found a discussion on the topic. This is the most important thing, because if the problem is not being discussed, it cannot be solved. When it comes to my work and my vision of how the situation, whether the situation has changed with impunity in Chechnya, because we're talking about the model of impunity that is in the basis of a totalitarian regime that can do as it pleases to people in the region with total impunity. Chechens uh, in the country, they have no right to live, the constitution doesn't cover them. In this particular regard, the situation may even go change for worse because if this crime is unpunished, this campaign against Chechen gays and this is a crime against humanity when you look at it. If this goes without, goes unpunished uh, for the Chechen authorities, uh, just like the murder of uh, Boris Nemtsov, Anna Politkovska, and Natalia Istimirova, this will become worse for the people in Chechnya and people who are trying to help them as well. On the other hand, this year has brought a huge progress in with the situation with punishment, maybe not criminal, not a law-based punishment, as if the world has fought back for what the Chechen leader is doing to its people, to his people. The most important impact or hit against uh, Kadyrov or his people in his surrounding during all the time that the regime has been in power is the Magnitsky uh, list includes Ramzan Kadyrov now and other people in his surrounding who have been truthfully, correctly uh, accused of violations of human rights. And the political decision that followed, practical punishment, his accounts in Instagram and Facebook were blocked. In, and whether it may sound funny for us maybe, for us, it's no punishment, right? But for a person who only in Instagram had more than 4 million followers and somebody who used this platform to spread his influence globally and fear, 
this was a big hit on their self-confidence and abilities and limited and put him in his place, basically. Mainly saying he is not a global evil, he's just a little um, hired gun that was hired so he would suppress the region that had declared its independence uh, one of the most rebellious regions in Russia. That is the, his, uh, the sole purpose for his existence. This was an amazing result of the work Igor and I have done together and huge support that it has seen around the world. Another issue is in Chechnya, this crime has happened because it had roots for it. Many years ago, the same methods have been used against other groups of people in Chechnya. And we must look at this crime in the context of what is happening in Europe, on European soil, in Russian soil, in a small region that we call Chechnya. This is the repetition of the regime that we've seen in the last century in the Nazi Germany and Stalin uh, Soviet Union. People must not and should not live like this while other people enjoy their freedoms. Even in Russia, at large, people are much freer, much more free than people in Chechnya itself. Okay, thank you very much. Отлично. Does anyone have a question? Um, what can we in the LGBT community here in the U.S. do to help support you, aside from supporting Freedom House, which is very important? What else can we do to, to support you? And in the Western world, I should say. First of all, I would like to say thank you to everybody for what you're already doing, what you've already done. Because if it were not for your voices, if it were not for your outrage a year ago when we have found out about the events in Chechnya, neither I nor Lena could have done nothing. Because only the attention on behalf of the international community, especially the international LGBT community, only their outrage has forced Kadyrov to stop, or at least partially stop his campaign. Only your attention to our work has allowed us the minimum of abilities to continue. Only that is a reason why we are not touched so far. They're not shutting us up anywhere, almost. Only sometimes for, for a day or two. That is why the most important thing is what you're doing already and what you should continue doing, in my opinion, is to speak loud, aloud about what is going on in Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey. We must understand that we live in a global, globalized world and any crime that is happening in any point in the world if it is not, if there is no reaction, loud reaction, it'll come back to bite us in a very unexpected way. It'll manifest itself in our country, in your country, sooner or later. Because the example of um, vicious uh, homo homophobia, tra uh, transphobia, xenophobic uh, violence, the example is contagious for all autocratic persons, all populists around the world. Therefore, we must show that we are not going to stand by and watch crimes happen, no matter where they happen to happen. Any transphobic, xenophobic crime in any point in the world against any person is the crime against us, me against you. And we must speak 
allowed. We must register our outrage allowed and the uh, suffering and the pain of the people in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Chechnya. This is our uh, suffering. We must scream about it from the rooftops because people who happen to live in those countries, they can't, they cannot speak or stand up for themselves. This is our duty, therefore, to speak for them. Thank you. Thank you, Igor, for this uh, really very impressive message that you now said. My name is Kastutis. I'm from members of Lithuania, and because Lithuania is accused uh, uh, not rightly being crucophobic, let me speak in Russian. Maybe you could translate. Uh, thank you. I admire your work and what you do. It's very important for us in Lithuania as well. Uh, not everything is done, maybe, and there's things to be done. Tolerance, uh, maximum level. Tolerance uh, has to be brought to the maximum and level. And Lithuania has supported your struggle, and it's very important what you do. I would like to ask uh, changes in Russia. Uh, is, Especially among the youth in universities. How is it done when you're going to more tolerant? Uh, uh, that these people who will be the, the building blocks of the future of Russia. Thank you. I would like to say, first of all, that we have seen in the last year with a very different uh, manifestations of bravery. And the example of Lithuania is a wonderful example when bravery is shown by an entire state, when everything was starting when we have received the very first information about the mass repressions in Chechnya. Very many nations representatives that we've been seeing would say, well, there is nothing we can do. We don't understand what we can do. And from the very beginning, we have heard no, yet many times. And Lithuania was the first country that said yes. Lithuania has been the first country that uh, decided to take in refugees. Lithuania is a very small country compared to Russia. Its relationship with Russia is not the most simple relationship, straightforward relationship. That is why on behalf of your country, this was a true manifestation of bravery. And thank you very much for this. Now I'll, go, I'll get to your question. I have said that the Russian society is very large. It, just like the United States society, it has people with very different views. And on the other hand, the Russian society is a Western society. It's a European society in its culture, in its views, and when the representative of the Russian state says something different, saying we have our own path, we have our own values, do not believe them. Especially that comes to the Russian youth, that is related to Russian youth. If people, in my opinion, have the uh, freedom of expression, very soon there will be no trace left of this ultra-conservatism, this hatred that we unfortunately are observing from the screens of the Russian federal television channels. The Russian society is an open one. It does want to be the part of the civilized world. However, unfortunately, the Russian state does not agree with us in that.
Yeah, um, uh, this is an amazing panel. Amaz amazing translation. Um, <laughs> never seen it, anything quite like it. Uh, uh, I want to salute the bravery of journalists uh, covering uh, Russia, and we've seen how dangerous it can be to try to tell the truth in that um, very scary environment for journalists. What can we do uh, as part of uh, the larger community, including LGBT, but also those of us who really uh, value a free press and, the, and want to support the courage of journalists who are willing to report on what's going on in, these, um, in the hatred and vitriol toward the LGBT community? When this situation has come about, the tragic situation in Chechnya, in truth, it is very tragic. This situation was a dead end because everything I could have done was to write a, an article without naming anyone or pointing a finger towards anybody who is responsible with the exception of the Chechen authorities. That would have been the end of it because I cannot go and save people, I cannot whisk them out, I cannot be a diplomat and meet or try to evacuate these people outside of Russia where they could be temporarily in safety. I was very lucky because LGBT network has come about, it stood next to us shoulder to shoulder. It has taken the practical, taken on the ma practical mission and it had the consequences for my publication because everything I could say, if the victims have come to me, I would say, there's nothing I can do for you, but they were there, they could help. The biggest part in basically equal work has been done by my colleagues, by journalists all over the world because they have paid attention to this subject, that they did want to not only write about it, but also to write in a manner that nothing stopped them, not only the difficulties, but unacceptable things for a journalist in any other situation where we told them we had to uh, provide for the safety of the victims. We talked them into speaking with journalists, saying we will provide security. We told the journalists of the leading publications of the world that these interviews will be anonymous, that we will be watching, that not a single identifying detail would be published in their reports or articles. This is an unacceptable condition for journalists. This is wrong to do that in any other situation, all things being equal. But in this particular case, it was the most important thing not only to tell the story, tell their audience, but to stand shoulder to shoulder with us and help us in a very precarious situation where we couldn't name a single person, where we could not allow the victims to speak on their own behalf. I will never forget this solidarity, this professional solidarity, because yes, I was the first one to write, okay, but this would have meant nothing if my colleagues around the world have not picked up and stood by my side and have done what I've done in these conditions and understanding how important it was to provide the safety of the people. With this solidarity, we could move mountains and solve all problems. And that moment, I have felt that journalists are a real power. This is something that changes the world. Thank you to all of my colleagues, all of my colleagues for instilling this sentiment, this feeling in me for the rest of my life. And I would like to add Okay, Lena, let's continue uh, praising each other then. <laughs> I did not praise you, I praise the LGBT network of Russia. <laughs> okay. 
All right, then I will praise all the journalists as well. Right. The thing is, they are being they're being condemned quite often lately, and they probably deserve some praise now. In this particular situation, when it comes to the persecution of gays in Chechnya, and the response of the world to these persecution events, there were a lot of unique moments, occurrences. One of these occurrences was a strong coalition, a mighty coalition among journalists and the human rights defenders. I have worked in the human rights defending movement for 10 years. I have not seen so much joint work when we have not only uh, given information to each other, which we of course do, but when we have worked as a single team. And this is a very unique experience for us, I think, and for us as well for journalists as well. I think this experience is worth remembering and maybe document, uh, documenting and maybe replicating elsewhere. Just like Elena, I would like to say great big thank you to all the journalists of the world for understanding, for their readiness to break the principles of their profession, for the sake of saving people. Because in two hours after this publication, uh, this uh, first article was published, the journalists of Russia have been started calling me, demanding that I produce the victims. I was in the metro, in the subway, that's why I couldn't talk to them on the phone. And I said, call me in half an hour, meaning I'll be in the office in half an hour. They said, oh, you will, you're going to produce the victims in half an hour, right? Of course, Lena and I, it was her, a lot of her personal work in this to explain to the journalists that, no, you're not going to see the, net, uh, the victims in half an hour, but with time and quite soon, we have learned to work together. And this has played a huge role in saving all these people, so thank you. Even my Russian colleagues have learned from this. Well, thank you. This was, uh, it was unsettling, it was eye-opening, and it kind of resets the perspective for a lot of us, I think, as Americans, as we look at the kind of unthinkable, almost, gains that gay rights, LGBT rights have made in the last decade in the United States, thinking that almost a, a, a decade ago, there were a handful of states where you could get married as a gay or lesbian couple, and now it's a constitutional nationwide right. But that doesn't take into account all of the progress that needs to be made. It needs to be made here, and needs to be made more broadly in the rest of the world. So thank you for sharing your stories with us today.